a little bit about how we can teach fan art, and Rachel's going to start us off, and then I'm going to finish this up. Okay. Okay. So Rachel, oh, okay. these are your ideas. So here's a couple for me uh, from different age groups. So the first one is kind of for every age kiddo, um, and you're creating your own fan art by copying the work through your peers' eyes. So you can either create the original character or um, going back to the idea of drawing on Rosa and bringing it into your imagination to think up a character that you already know of. But then it might come out in a different way. And then you just kind of round robin it around and have everybody draw that character, but it comes out in their own style. So it kind of is like a game of telephone, but yeah. a visual <laughs> telephone. It's pretty cool. Um, but that's also a nice way of seeing how an image can change and adjust through different eyes, and also a way to kind of be thoughtful about looking for particular styles that a student artist might have. So you can instead of just what you receive in like TV or comics and so on. Um, an upper level project that I do is in Style Of, which is a research and art project for high school students where they um, choose a particular artist and then research some of their stylistic choices. So in some ways it's less about replicating an existing work and looking at the entire uh, body of work from a particular artist and then looking for some of those key stylistic choices and uh, thematic aspects and then creating an original work with those as a guideline. Um, so, you know, obviously we can go from like a really easy example of like Van Gogh uses the same kind of brush strokes, how can we apply that in a different way, um, to something that's a little more pointed and specific uh, for an artist that's less well known. So it's a nice way to again get out of your comfort zone as an artist, um, but then also to do some constructive research about the light and the intent and all those other things about a particular artist that works in the world. Uh, and then for younger uh, students, I have a What Happens Next project, which is always really fun. Um, so in this way, you look at an artwork and you have a critique discussion with the kiddos, and then they talk about some of the things that they observe happening. So details like, you know, who is in this image? What is happening in the image? How do you know? What are some other details you can pull out of it? And using those details, they uh, will then draw a What Happens Next, as though it was next to the panel of a comic in that way. Um, and that way, they also are looking for some of those key stylistic observable details and so on, but then putting in their own imagination and imaginative twist on it so that they are thinking about conceptually what actions or movements or so on will lead us to think that what happens next would happen next. Um, and that can be also accompanied with some bright digital images if you're trying to get all those interdisciplinary projects. I also just want to point out like if, if you want any lesson plans or photos of any of these, please feel free to reach out to me or, or to any of this really cool. yeah. I'm happy to share. And to that extent, like these are some of the lessons that I thought that involved fan art. So fre uh, freshman fan art piece, I have taught high school before. I've noticed that when it comes to, especially freshmen, incoming freshmen, they're very hesitant. Um, at my previous school, uh, a lot of them were kind of like very new to new to the school. They didn't really know a lot of people because it was solely a high school. So um, what I would have them do is they were required. They had to take a famous work of art and replace some part of it with a character or a famous celebrity um, from their favorite show, comic, book, movie, whatever, um, in, inserting that person or character into the work of art in some way, shape, or form. My immediate thought with this that I would show them is think of Squidward from SpongeBob SquarePants who always likes to do himself in every single type of medium and every single type of um, the next one that I've done with multiple different grade levels is a little bit of a case study with um, Marvel versus Jack Kirby's kids. This was a big issue a couple years ago when Marvel was about to be acquired by Disney. Um, Jack Kirby's kids came out and we were saying like, no, we want some of these royalties. This is when Spider-Man was on the rise. Um, the students had to read the original article about this. Um, and answer prompted questions about who they think was right or who they think was wrong. I don't give any guiding answers. I make sure it's completely open-ended. I just give them the first article about it, and if they want to research it further, they can. The fun part about this is I tell them that if, like, whoever gets the topic, like, not answers, but whoever gives me, like, some of the best responses, I actually get a chance to send it to the judge who happens to be my mother. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was the original judge on that case, so I tell them, you know, I'll hand it off to the judge, and she loves it because she likes to give that feed, feedback to those students. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and she has come in and talked to the students about that whole issue before, and it's, a, it's very interesting. 
Um, and one of the last projects I do teach or have taught in the past is an idea of a final reproduction project where students are actually picking a famous work of art that was stolen from a selected time frame. And they have to recreate it to the best of their ability. So that goes back to the idea of copying someone as well. Um, and a lot of those pieces that I make them pick are stolen masterpieces. So two of the, two of the biggest ones that I focus on are the, um, if you think of Monuments Men, World War II, uh, a lot of those artworks were stolen. There's, a lot of them are still missing. That's still actually something that goes on today where they're trying to recover them. Um, and then the other one is actually the Barber Museum Heist. That's another big one that's, that's actually still open as well. Um, so they have to pick something from one of those sorts of things or if they know of another one. And they have to reproduce it to the best of their ability. And, Yes. Okay, so I am a teacher and also a fan artist. Yes. And so a lot of artist alleys also, so there's a, this is an unspoken rule, but a lot of artist alleys follow it. A lot of companies won't mind if you do a small run of printed fan art. Yes. They won't have a problem. The only people that really have a problem are Disney, and not all of Disney characters. Like yes. Mickey and those main oh, characters, God. they have a huge problem. Yeah. Although um, Disney almost lost their copyright with Mickey a couple, like I think it was like um, earlier this year. It was coming, yeah, public yeah. domain, but then they snatched it back. It's because it's of Disney that we have the copyright laws that we have right now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. before everything yeah. used to come up to public domain. Was it 50, every, every 50 years? Yeah, yeah. something but along those lines. Like, That's what we wanted for life. And we yeah. changed copyright law altogether. That's not yeah. the fair but deal most, for like. Most yeah. artists, at least if, if students, I work with young children. So yeah. my children are never going to be, we're not never, but they're not. Million, like 
like pieces of artwork. Um, I know I've never had a problem in terms of my own like mini pieces. Um, you know, they're pretty much one and done. So I've never really come across a problem. I think that more, I would say, I don't want to say it applies more to the idea of 2D, but you know, obviously when it comes to some to some of that art, it's one of the things where I would say just have a little bit of caution.